Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to uh, the first in a series of webinars convened by the Global Health Technologies Coalition, um, focusing on issues uh, related to financing coordination of global health research and development. Uh, the Global Health Technologies Coalition, or the GHTC, is a coalition of more than two dozen nonprofit organizations involved in global health research and development, both in the development of technologies, doing advocacy, um, as well as um, creating thought pieces related to advancing and accelerating global health research and development. Um, this webinar is meant to be a platform for education and sharing of ideas around emerging issues and initiatives aimed at improving the coordination and financing of global health R&D. I want to reiterate that this is not necessarily a platform for creating consensus around advocacy, though we do hope that this leads um, to, to greater engagement and investment in and more informed and evidence-based advocacy work. Um, this first session is going to be on pooled R&D funding mechanisms. We do plan to do um, at least two other webinars um, in next year, and at the end of this webinar, we will actually be soliciting some input from you on what would be some useful topics that we might want to explore in future webinar sessions. Um, Today, what we're going to, the structure that we're going to go through is we're going to get a history and overview of pooled R&D funding mechanism from Dr. Mary Moran of Policy Cures, followed by perspectives from um, the WHO, Rob Terry from the WHO, Lara Pandia from European Developing Country Clinical Trials Partnership, or EDCTP, as well as Andrea Lucard from the Medicines for Malaria Ventures, which is a public-private, oh, sorry, a product development partnership based in Geneva, um, and then followed by um, uh, Mary giving an overview of what are some of the implications, potential, not an exhaustive list, but some of the implications of pooled funding mechanisms on the broader R&D financing um, landscape, and then we're going to um, have a panel discussion amongst us and open it up to the broader particip the participant community to submit questions, raise issues. Um, I do want to encourage you to send in your thoughts, questions, perspectives throughout the discussion and we will try to address um, as much as, as many issues as come up. Um, what we don't or we're not able to address during this session will be captured in a final meeting report. So I don't want people to think that we're going to forget about what people have raised and as appropriate, we will try and follow up um, to provide more information about uh, issues that are raised but are not necessarily addressed. Um, so I'm going to, rather than me spend too much time um, giving you some basic information about the webinar, I want to actually get us started. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Mary Moran, who is the Executive Director of Policy Cures based in Australia. There you go. Uh, um, thanks. Thanks very much, Claire. Um, I'm delighted to be here today and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm, I've been asked to give an overview of pooled funding. So it's a very brief introduction to, to quite a complex field. So I'm going to try to run through it very quickly and so that the other panel members can give their perspective. Uh, so first of all, why, why, why would you ask me? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're Policy Cures is an independent non-profit research group. We were founded about 10 years ago at the London School of Economics. And we specialise in R&D for diseases of the developing world. W in terms of pool funding, it is something we've worked on for about 10 years. So um, I was in, actually in the room at the inception of the idea for the R&D Treaty Pool Fund, which has become the fund that Rob now uh, runs. Um, and I was involved in two of the four WHO consultations on pool funding. So it's a, a, an issue which is close to my heart. So in terms of what I'll talk about in my, in over about 10 minutes, uh, what's a pool fund? What's their history? Because that's the key to understanding the different funds. What are their main points of difference? And just a really quick overview of, of the many funds there are. So as a sort of one-liner, a pooled fund is it's a coordinating body where multiple donors put their funding into one fund and that fund funds multiple projects out of it. 
And the idea is that you'll improve coordination, uh, you'll get rid of duplication, you'll improve prioritisation, and you'll be able to identify and address gaps. So in a nutshell, that's what a pool fund is. But what I thought I'll do, it's always much easier if you have a, a concrete example. And so I'd like to give the example of the GIT. The GIT. We have some truly dreadful acronyms, and you will hear more of them. But Lara has the worst one. <laughs> Uh, the GIT is the Global Health Innovation Technology Fund, and it was set up last year. It's a non-profit fund for neglected diseases. And I know this slide's quite hard to see, but this is how, how it looks on their website, and I can talk you through it. So what happens is a number of people put funding in, which is the Government of Japan, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Japanese pharma industry, a number of Japanese pharma companies. Their focus is on developing country access and so making and access to these products, they specifically explicitly state we don't seek financial returns. They've dispersed 28 million so far and if you look at the slide, there's three diseases there. The top one, the mosquito is malaria, the lungs is TB and I have no idea what the bottom thing is, but that is neglected tropical diseases. And what they fund is a portfolio from really early discovery right through to final product development clinical trials and each of those boxes represents a partnership. So you can see that when the, the donors put their money in, they're able to fund across a number of diseases and products and research stages. And that's exactly how a pool fund uh, does work and, and should work. Now this slide is the most important one. If you understand the history, you're able to quickly locate any fund. As soon as someone describes it to you, you, you understand where it fits. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this one. So historically, there's been two kinds of diseases. There were commercial diseases, things like cancer and diabetes, uh, that occurred in rich countries, so chronic diseases. And there were neglected diseases, usually infectious diseases, that occurred in poor countries, things like malaria, TB, sleeping sickness. Uh, the commercial pharmaceutical industry looked after those type 1 chronic diseases. They did the R&D for that. And the neglected diseases were the responsibility of the public sector. And the main way that responsibility was picked up was through TDR, the organisation that Rob represents. Now, TDR was set up 40 years ago it, in 1974, and it was the first pooled fund. Uh, the funding towards the end was about 30 million a year, which came from member states, like the pool fund that's being proposed now. And TDR funded just drug development and for the 10 neglected diseases in their portfolio. So um, there was a, a several helmets diseases, kinetoplastids, uh, malaria and TB were in their portfolio. And TDR were essentially the first um, product development partnership of the kind that Andrea talks about. So they did partnered R&D with pharmaceutical companies to make drugs that were suitable for the developing world and they were provided generally at very low cost. So just some examples, because TDR, I think we forget how much they accomplished. Um, they developed ivermectin for river blindness with Merck, that was free, a free drug. Uh, Coartem pediatric with Novartis, that was, that's 90 cents. Uh, Praziquantil for schistosomiasis, and that was developed with Merck. That was more expensive, it was 250 But the thing with TDR was it had no pipeline. This is all ad hoc opportunistic product development. So they had the pool of funding, but they actually didn't have the portfolio, uh, the portfolio of products. They had individual opportunistic projects with different companies. So this is how the world looked for quite a long time. And then what happened was the AIDS drug crisis. Now, AIDS, is, AIDS, this was the genesis of the WHO pooled fund that we see today and that Rob's talking about. And what happened was AIDS highlighted the problem of the commercial intellectual property system. And under that system, how you do R&D is it's funded from profits. And the profits come from sales to patients. And that's called linkage. So essentially, patient money is what funds R&D. Um, the problem is, of course, how you make profits is by charging high prices. So a lot of patients couldn't afford that R&D um, and couldn't afford to get AIDS drugs. Now, this crisis led to the proposal for the R&D treaty and for the need for a pooled fund. And that was about 10 years ago. And the proposal said we should have publicly funded and invented drugs. They should be sold to patients at cost price. 
How we'll do it is each country will give a percentage of their GDP and put it into the pool fund. And a key feature will be that it will be completely delinked. We'll delink R&D funding from sales to patients. We'll get rid of intellectual property and patents. We'll try and make this open source. So the primary goal of this fund, of this proposal, was actually delinkage. And uh, so it was primarily about access to commercial drugs uh, because neglected diseases, of course, have no profits to delink from. But the reason I have a plus is that the proposal was the fund would naturally also include the, the existing neglected disease work of the kind that TDR was doing. So holding this in your mind, this idea is aimed at getting R&D for commercial drugs in a different way through getting rid of intellectual property and also funding neglected diseases. Now this slide, the font's quite small, but what we now have is two processes. We have the WHO process, which stem from this proposed treaty and it said we'll set up a pilot fund and that decision was made this year to have a pilot fund and if that's successful then we'll have a pooled fund at TDR in 2016. Now this is a, um, the features of this approach are of these funds is they're political uh, so it needs political engagement from the countries, the medicines will be non-profit to everyone including high income countries presumably they'll be available generically um, it includes commercial diseases, type 1 diseases, as well as neglected diseases. And the focus is very much on delinkage, um, on, on not having a privately held intellectual property, having this in the public domain. And I'll leave Rob to talk more about that, but that's very important to understand. That's the nature of the, the WHO fund. Now, all the other funds are in the second column. These all sit outside the WHO process. These have also been developed over the past 10 years. There's Lara's fund, EDCTP2, uh, the GIT, which we talk, I briefly showed you the slide of the GIF. There's Appleman, there's a European Investment Bank fund and so on. Now, all these funds differ from the WHO fund. They're non-political, completely agnostic about intellectual property. They also make medicines non-profit, the, but only to developing world, not to high-income countries and they don't cover commercial diseases, they're only for neglected diseases. So one of the, the probably the key distinction then with the first fund, and I'll quote from the, the designer of the original R&D treaty, says it much better than I could, so I'll read what he said, talking about the WHO fund. He said, this is the first time a fund has been set up committed to the principle of delinkage that includes not just neglected diseases but commercial type 1 diseases. It means that delinkage has been mainstream. This has been the end game of the innovation and access movement. And that's what that fund is. That's the passion behind that fund. So, as I said, I'll, I'll leave Rob to talk about the WHO fund, which is driven by that passion. I'll briefly explain all the other pool funds because now they're all roughly the same. And this is my last slide, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> so basically, pretty well all the funds are in a kind of a, a middle place. So you have the WHO fund which says, we'll try not to involve pharmaceutical companies and we don't want intellectual property. Then we have all these traditional um, public and philanthropic funds, so EDCTP, the GIT, the Appleman fund, the ones you see there. Um, these are all uh, the, the, the ones I described in the second column. So they focus on neglected, non-profit neglected diseases, but they work with companies and, and they're happy to use intellectual property. They're all non-profit. The final column is these new funds that have started popping up in the past year. And these actually say, we are happy to make a profit in the Western world. And so what these funds do is they say... Um, we expect to get some return from private investors. We want to bring in private capital. Uh, we expect to sell this stuff in developed country markets and use that to reimburse the fund. Now, the first of those funds was the GIF, which is another acronym. This is the Global Health Investment Fund uh, set up by the Gates Foundation and a number of investors. But the European Investment Bank is talking about another fund, which will take this a step further. They're talking about also making profits in the developed world. So what we have now is a range of funds from essentially no companies, no IP, no profits, to companies and IP but no profits, to companies and IP and profits. And that's kind of the framework um, that, that I think it helps to think about pool funds in terms of. The last slide is only up because I'm going to come back to this later. On the left is a list of some of the funds and proposed funds. 
And basically what you see is the who, what and where of every fund is different. Who they fund, what they focus on in terms of diseases and products, and some are conditional. We have to have an African, we have to have a Japanese, it has to be in the Asia Pacific. So you can see that rather than a coordinated central pool fund, we actually have a lot of very different funds now on the table with more being proposed. So I hope that wasn't too confusing. What yeah, a whirlwind. That was actually quite <laughs> impressive given the many different types. and the They made another new fund last week after I'd finished my presentation. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? We'll have to put that as an addendum for the meeting report. Thanks so much, Mary. Not at all. Thank you. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Rob Terry from TDR, the WHO Special Program on Research and Training for Neglected Tropical Diseases, um, to talk about the TDR pooled fund that Mary was alluding to. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just we've already heard it. I mean, TDR, uh, it's its 40th year of operation right now. And uh, in actual fact, what some of the, the PDPs that exist, that were uh, sort of incubated out, uh, out of TDR. So in a sense, we uh, no longer have product development as a sort of key uh, function, uh, but we're still very interested in, in shaping the agenda and putting forward uh, these ideas about how do we actually innovate in the process of doing R&D itself. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's one of the, the things that I'm sort of most interested in. Um, the, the fund that I'm talking about now was a, a, the outcome of a very long negotiation actually um, started through the World Health Assembly of WHO uh, over sort of 10, 10, 12 years or more. And in actual fact, this isn't the, the, the R&D treaty which a lot of people were pushing for because in the end there was very little support for a negotiated settlement. And so the intention was to actually try to move forward on the areas where there were agreement and to move forward with a voluntary system. So we, we kind of have a voluntary system now. Uh, and that's what the, this diagram uh, that I, I hope you can see uh, um, will, will show. And in a sense, this takes forward a lot of the ideas that Mary sort of put forward in her summary about what are the sort of strengths and the advantages of, of pooled funding. You know, why, why bother to do something in, in a pooled way? So essentially, if we start in the, in the top right-hand right, right -hand corner, and this is the proposal. This hasn't been uh, fully approved yet, but this is where we've got to in our thinking. And so I think it's very important today with this webinar to hear how people react and, and how this, uh, how this is uh, responded to by, by people who have an interest. But member states essentially, and it is the member states, so the, the countries which are part of WHO would be responsible for putting funds into a joint enterprise, into a pooled fund. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily exclude other donors. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we have uh, some very active and, and, and large uh, philanthropic organizations out there. But I think if there a mechanism could be found uh, for industry to do this without uh, altering uh, the objectives, then I think we, it's something that's definitely worth exploring. The interesting thing, I think, within the, the arrangement that we're looking at here is if we go to a pooled fund is that it not only funds R&D projects, and those projects, as Mary has already said, would be very much uh, around the, the principles that came out of the, the sort of negotiations of this, uh, of, of the sort of impact of intellectual property on R&D. And so it's around um, innovation in research, it's around assur assuring affordability of the final product and accessibility um, is, is right up front in the selection. But this fund would also support a process for, se for selecting priorities. Uh, and uh, this is called a, an R&D observatory, which in some way would be able to monitor uh, who is funding what, where, and how uh, globally. It's, it's actually, uh, as we've heard, there's a sort of fragmented approach to, to pool funding. But in global health generally now, there are thousands and thousands of actors. And in actual fact, trying to get this, this general picture about who's funding what, where, and how is very, very difficult. Once we have those priorities uh, assessed, then TDR, using uh, the, the experience that it's had over many years of, of supporting R&D, uh, would take that and develop uh, calls for proposals. Again, all of this would be in a sort of open and transparent way. Uh, and that would be reported back through the World Health Assembly. Uh, there's obviously a lot more detail behind it, but essentially um, that's really what, uh, what the thinking would be. And, and what are the, the sort of advantages to that? Well, I think, first of all, it's the first attempt 
uh, at a globally negotiated R&D fund. And I think that's really important. Uh, and I think, again, it would be agreeing what are the global targets. What, what, you know, often we talk about the neglected diseases, but in actual fact, there are many different definitions and many different targets. And I don't think, uh, actually, one of the things that the public sector has been very good at is clearly articulating what are those priorities. So that would be very important. I think the new mechanism here, which is as we've been receiving pledges from countries, so particularly the traditional donor countries, is that they're saying we will, be, we will be prepared to put money into this fund, but we will have a certain portion of that funding itself, which will be leveraged if there is a donation from a low or middle income country. And to a certain extent, one of the, the hopes is that we would, by doing that, expand the, the, the pool of donations into this fund. We, we had a, there was the release of the GFinder report yesterday, uh, and it's quite clear really that uh, the sort of the global s sort of envelope for funding, while it changes year on year, is broadly staying around about the same, plus or minus three, uh, three billion. So if we're going to expand that fund, then we really need to be able to access uh, and, and see if we can actually mobilize uh, resources from the low and middle income countries, the emerging economies. I think the, the advantages of pooled funding, what are the advantages? Well, I think it is around shared risk because essentially research is about risk. It's about covering uh, failure. The majority of the research that's undertaken actually results in, in things that don't work. And so we need to cover those costs and, and that's, a, that's a, a, a difficult thing. But pooled funding allows for shared success. So even if uh, the contributions into a fund might be at very, very different levels, what this could allow is that countries, particularly say the disease endemic countries, which may not have a huge contribution to make financially as a volume to the global debate, by, by putting their money into a pooled fund, can share in that success and can access these other sources of funding that we're talking about. Um, I think on a sort of process level, uh, pooled funding uh, should make the transaction costs less. So the, the process of, nego of negotiating, working with a, a pooled fund which may have 10 or 20 different donors into it, you only actually have to deal with one of them when you're working. And I'm sure MMV would agree that to, to reduce the amount of reporting is one of the ways that we may well be able to reduce some of the, the costs of producing these products. Um, and I think the, the strength that TDR brings in, in a governance arrangement here is that it has a very strong representation from the disease endemic countries themselves. And I think that's really important when we're talking uh, about setting priorities and working on those priorities. Um, I think there will remain I'm not, many, many challenges, and probably the biggest challenge in operating in this way is bringing together the political and the technical agenda. Uh, all of us can make the moral case and can make the scientific case, and that's very, very uh, necessary. But I think until we start making the political case as to why this is of value, then it's going to be much, much harder to actually sort of see a, a real sea change. Um, Obviously, no pooled fund is going to be big enough. I think so the size and the sustainability of this fund, I think, is going to be a real challenge. But we'll see uh, how that works. I've been quite surprised about the, the pledges that we've received already. But we do have to be realistic about timescales, and we do have to be realistic about impact. This is only, at the end of the day, going to be one strand in a whole range of, of tools that we need uh, if we're going to sort of move forward with uh, the sort of sustainable funding uh, for R&D in this area. Great. Thank you so much. That I mean, this is great to hear an update on, on this pooled fund. There was a lot of excitement when this got announced, but really a, a lack of understanding about what it is. So I encourage um, our participants to send in questions for Rob to, to quiz him some more. I've already got some down for our discussion. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Lara Pandia from EDCTP, also known as the European Developing Country, Developing Country Trials Partnership, um, to talk to us about the EDCTP model of pooled funding mechanisms. Thank you. Uh, so thank you again for the opportunity to participate in this webinar. Um, so actually, um, we've been around for a while now, since 2003 we were established. Um, we were established as a co-decision um, of the European Parliament and the Council as an Article 185 initiative from the European Union Treaty. Um, for those of you that don't know, the background to this was largely in response to 
um, the Millennium Development Goals and the challenges being posed by the three main poverty-related diseases, HIV, AIDS, malaria and tuberculosis. And um, the idea was really largely to promote an integrated approach to health research um, among European countries um, through the coordination of participating states' national programs. Um, so I think EDCTP is quite unique in the sense that it's um, a multi-country, multi-stakeholder pooled funding mechanism and that the idea is actually with a focus between a partnership between Europe and Africa. Um, and um, I, yeah, I, so the first program really was essentially um, set up with 200 million euros from the European Union and that was then, uh, the program was successful in then leveraging um, at least 200 million from um, European member states and other third parties. Um, I think um, during the evaluation of the program, there was, uh, the first program, there was um, some limitations identified and um, one of the main ones, well there were two main ones I think, were related to the conditions imposed on the funding. So actually there were co-funding requirements at the project level on the EDCTP funds um, that meant that there was a burden placed on the research community to come up with secured co-funding at the project level before they could secure EDCTP funding. Um, and that was of course difficult, time consuming and, and quite unattractive I think for a lot of applicants. Um, at the second level, funding was also restricted to public um, legal entities, which meant that we couldn't really, strictly speaking, fund, um, for example, product, product development partnerships or other private um, organisations. Um, the scope of the programme was also somewhat limited. We were only focused on the three poverty-related diseases of HIV, malaria and tuberculosis and on phase two and three clinical trials. And our calls were also quite narrow and prescriptive. They were very focused on disease um, or intervention-specific um, calls. Um, and I think probably one of the also a major limitation was the legal structure of the organisation, which meant that although we were a partnership between Africa and Europe, we weren't actually really a partnership because many African countries, or no African countries, could really be members of the, organ of the partnership. So for the second program, which um, will was now been launched fr from 2014 to 2024, um, we um, are trying to we have tried to address some of these limitations. Um, so actually, this the second program for those of you that don't know um, is uh, also funded through um, well we have a commitment from the European Union for up to 283 million euros. Um, uh, for the 10-year programme, conditional or matched funding from uh, European EDCTP participating states, uh, whether in cash or in kind. Um, and we also have a, an objective to try and leverage uh, at least 500 million euros um, from third parties, which we consider to be um, private um, sector industry, um, development agencies, foundations, and also non European Union countries um, or non-EDCTP participating states, so for example the US or um, other African countries. Um, and with uh, this program, um, we, I think we've managed to address a lot of the challenges from the first program. So we have a new legal structure, we've transitioned from a European Economic Interest Group to an association under Dutch law. This means that we've been able to expand our membership, um, EDCTP2, is now a public-public partnership between um, uh, sovereign states in both Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. We currently have 24 um, members, 11 of which are from Sub-Saharan Africa, and we have three further members um, in the lineup to join. Um, and uh, we now also have a broader scope. We've now expanded beyond the three um, diseases to also include neglected infectious diseases um, prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as to other emerging infectious diseases of particular relevance to Africa, for example, Ebola. And um, in terms of the, the trials that we support, we've expanded to phase one right through to phase four clinical trials, um, as well as health services optimization research. Um, so with um, the budget, which 683 million, that's over three times the budget from the first program, the magnitude of the program is, has increased. This also means that we can be more ambitious. We can support larger, um, more impactful projects, for example, phase three clinical trials. Um, and we will also work with a very transparent operational process. We will have annual work plans 
um, with upfront commitments that have to be approved by the European Commission and the EDCTP General Assembly. And our calls will also be much broader, less prescriptive, uh, bottom-up open calls that allow the research community to really dictate what the needs are. Um, in terms of the co-funding, that also will be addressed. So we will now, um, hun for the majority of our calls, we will fund 100% um, plus 25% um, indirect costs. So at the project level, there won't be um, a burden on applicants to secure co-funding. Um, and but despite that, we at the EDCTP Secretariat will, of course, still strongly advocate for co-funding at the programmatic level from um, from European Union member states, from third parties, and so on, and from African, now African member states too. Um, and uh, probably also very important to note is that the private sector participation has also now been addressed. And uh, in the second programme, any legal entity, whether public or private, can participate in, in EDCTP projects. And if they're located in um, European Union, Union um, member states or in Horizon 2020 associated countries um, or sub-Saharan Africa, they will also be eligible to receive funding. So in probably my last couple of minutes, I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of advantages that I see from pooled funding mechanisms from EDCTP's perspective. Um, I think from our side that we feel that um, this pooled funding mechanism is a, is a means of ensuring better coordination, alignment, collaboration of national um, programs. And that means also that the cost effectiveness of European and African investments is, is, yeah, made, is improved. Um, we also hope that through this mechanism we can extend international cooperation um, in and between um, with public and private um, partners um, to maximise impact and ensure synergies are identified and also to leverage funding from, as Rob said, from both European and also um, African countries. Um, we also feel, or at least I feel, that as a common, a common pot mechanism really means that you have um, a large pot of money, which means for us EDCTP2, we have a much larger pot. We can support larger multi-center trials um, that are beyond the resources of a single agency. So by pooling funds, it means that you can fund a lot more with your money. And that, I think, means that there's an optimal use of resources. Um, and I think it's very important to note for EDCTP the fact we will have upfront commitments. So by having a dedicated pot of funding, it means that the funds are there, they're available, and they can be independently allocated according to the needs as and when they're identified. Um, and that means that we can also be more rapid and, and flexible in responding to the, to the needs. I won't repeat Rob's point. I think that's a valid, valid point that by having a pooled funding mechanism, you also reduce the administrative burden for funders, but also for applicants. There's one common point. Um, you can also try and ensure practices are standardized, and, and that reduces a lot of inefficiencies. But um, my last couple of points, just um, to highlight, I think there are ongoing challenges. Um, I think for EDCTP, for us to be able to achieve all those, those advantages that I see for a pooled funding mechanism, you also need to um, ensure that the contributions are unrestricted cash contributions that, that enable you to, to have flexibility in the way that you run the, the, the mechanism. And, you know, unlike development aid, which is, um, is much more easily spent internationally, traditionally research funds tend to be much more restricted. Um, they have tend to be tied to national researchers or have to particular research goals. Um, and I think it's important for us to be able to be efficient to have unrestricted cash co-funding. And I think it will always remain a challenge to identify common areas of interest. And I think we will need to work on trying to ensure that there are mechanisms through which we can jointly fund and coordinate our funding so that we are much more efficient. We can um, recognize synergies and work better at an earlier stage. And I think the Ebola crisis has proved that a little bit as well, the importance. So that's a little bit. Thank you very much, Laura. And I want to say I'm impressed it's taken us this long to mention Ebola. <laughs> 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 day and age. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to um, turn now to Andrea Lucard, as I said, from Medicines for Malaria Ventures to get the perspective of a product developer um, and really also working across different types of sectors. What has been, you know, what are your thoughts? What's the interaction for MMV? Um, uh, researching but also engaging with 
uh, and considering pooled funding mechanisms to advance your agenda. Thank you. Um, I would, uh, I wish that I could actually speak to you, the audience, directly and find out how many of you are actual product development partnerships or people who are seeking pooled funding um, so that I could direct my comments as, as effectively as possible. Not, not given that opportunity, I'm going to um, really try to take the perspective of being both a pooled fund ourselves, since we actually make uh, contributions to research that, from, that come from multiple donors, and also as a recipient of, um, of pooled funding from almost all of, or at least being engaged with almost all of the funds that, um, that Mary um, has mentioned. To give a little bit of sense of um, MMV, we're a product development partnership that's been in existence for 15 years. We have five products that have been um, uh, pre-qualified at this point, including coartum dispersible, um, and most recently um, two new um, uh, interventions that have been pre-qualified by the WHO. Um, and so we really do have experience of what it means to, to be using the money to, to to, uh, to fund research, but also to, to get our research funded. Um, and our experience has been mixed um, with, this, with, with pooled funds. Um, if I speak uh, mostly, first of all, about why you would search for funding from pooled funds, um, the first and most obvious one is that there's money there, and our organizations require funding to keep products being developed. There's absolutely no question. Um, and therefore, um, particularly in, with large funds, um, the amount of work and effort required to seek that funding is very, very important. Um, another reason that you would really want to seek pooled funding um, is to bring in new partners. Um, Mary mentioned the, um, the GHIT fund or the GIT um, fund, <laughs> depending on how the uh, Global Health Innovation Technologies Fund um, out of Japan. This has been very important to us um, in recent years. Uh, they just started uh, 18 months ago or something like that, yeah, um, very, very recently. And the reason that they've been so important um, to us has been actually outside of the funding itself specifically, but because they have a mandate to make sure that Japanese partners are engaged. Now, this is not at all unusual for any one of these funds where you need African partners engaged or you have a particular need to get at something that is beyond just whether or not products are going to be developed. This is the, the, our mandate is make sure the products are developed. The mandate of the pooled funds is to make sure products are developed and something else in some other way. Um, and in the case of the, uh, the GHIT fund, what's been so critical for us has been, in fact, not only that we need to have Japanese partners, but they have helped us facilitate bringing those partnerships on board. There's been pressure on multiple sides to make sure that the partnerships uh, are engaged. Japanese ph uh, pharma is, is very, very sophisticated, but it's been difficult for the product development partnerships to, to actually develop many of those partnerships. And so far, it's been extremely successful. Um, that's an example of a pooled fund that has really brought um, tremendous value to us. What's interesting is if you imagine what that looks like from the inside of a, of a product development partnership, um, it is not the fundraisers who are running that um, mechanism. It is the scientists. It's the scientists themselves who have to make the decision as to whether or not these kinds of partnerships are possible. Is there technology that exists within those Japanese com companies <coughs> that's useful for us? The companies themselves have to decide if there's something that's useful. So while we're used to thinking about funding as receiving funds, restricted or unrestricted, but essentially receiving funds and allocating it as needed, um, that tends to be a sort of technical fundraising um, aspect. This requires a much more um, coordinated and sophisticated operations within uh, a, a product development partnership. Um, what becomes interesting is if you imagine that you divide up many of these product, um, these pooled funds, um, you start talking about dividing up your portfolio itself into very many places. So we start saying, does this have an African partner? Okay, then we can start thinking about EDCDP. Are we talking about intellectual property? That might be the CEWG process. Can we bring in a Japanese partner? 
in that case. And what happens within the organization is the, the pool expands tremendously, but so do the demands on the organization, the technical demands and the scientific demands, the partnership demands. Now, if you're an organization like MMV or many of the other product development partnerships um, who have been around for a while and who have fairly robust processes, fairly sophisticated legal departments, business development partnerships, uh, partners, um, and within the, within the organization. Um, it's not such a daunting task. I will say that if I were a new product development partnership and I were trying to imagine whether or not we could actually engage in one of these pooled funds, I wouldn't recommend it, at initially at, at least, unless you really have a very clear ability to understand how your portfolio fits into these additional needs of the, of the pooled fund. Um, and so, th so th th those, that balance is something that we continue to uh, struggle with would be too strong a word, but we continue to negotiate mm -hmm. within our organization. And as these funds proliferate, um, they become, the questions become more and more complex around it. Um, what I would also say is that that one of the concerns that we have as a product development partnership is that the bilateral funding that we have been receiving over time um, is our core and most important funding. Um, and to the degree that any of our bilateral funders might turn in some direction and say, uh, we no longer wish to give bilateral funding in this, in this way because we're going to be doing it in a pooled fund, that could be devastating for us. And I won't say it will be, don't know, um, but it could be because this, um, the relationships that, that we have um, are, are, very, are currently quite straight, relatively straightforward. That said, I would echo what you both said before, um, that in working with um, a donor such as Unitaid, it certainly is more straightforward to deal with Unitaid than it is to deal with all of the Unitaid partners within it. So again, there's a real balance in this, uh, in this way. And I'll leave it to other questions from there. And I think, I think your last point particularly is, is one that I certainly know in my questions, if not in Mary's uh, follow-up, will, will come up, that idea of bilateral aid and, and the multilateral. So, Mary, I'm going to turn it to you for just uh, some final thoughts on, sure. on what may be some of the implications um, of pooled funding. And recognizing you are not giving it an exhaustive list, this is really something to yeah. get us to think about this and, and to stimulate some discussion. Um, yeah, so, and I, and I think I can be briefer too because you guys have covered uh, quite a lot of this. So, of course, as we said, the aim of pool funds was to improve coordination um, and to get rid of duplication. But I think the funds have had real pros and cons, that, as Andrea said, and the key one she pointed out, new money, we'd all agree on. So I don't think it's a question of do we think they're a good idea? We do. The question is how they should be designed and I, I think that's something we need to discuss. Uh, the second step, they are one step up in terms of coordination because um, instead of all independent donors, you do have some groups of donors who now get together. But it's certainly the case that there's, uh, coordination <laughs> isn't their strength at the moment. And the second thing, they do give you a lot of choice. So you can pretty well pick the fund that matches your ideology. If you want to fund capacity building in Africa, you can go with EDCTP. If you want to fund something that's more market focused, you can go with the GIF. If you want to fund something that doesn't have intellectual property ownership and is seen as more of a public venture, you can go with the WHO pool fund. So I think they're, they're definite uh, pros. The cons are it's a really fragmented funding picture and actually the funds I think are making it more a lot less fragmented because what you do, it's like a Venn diagram. You now have you had the individual bilateral donors and you now have them grouped up in different sets of donors on top of the bilateral donors. So that's one thing. The second thing is I don't think that's going to change because really big funders and sovereign states, lots of them don't like putting their money into a pool fund where someone else is going to make the decisions. And the US isn't in any of these funds because they're big hitters and they can, they're big boys and they'll make up their own mind. And I think the Gates Foundation sets up its own pool funds um, and it contributes to other people's pool funds, but they like making, they like influencing the decisions. And that's human nature, so I'm not sure, and sovereign state nature, so I'm not sure if that will be overcome. Two other, there's two other issues that I think are important. Um, 
one is this level of conditionality makes it really hard for people to see where they can fit in. So there's a new fund set up in the Asia Pacific for malaria and they said we actually we're scratching our head. Can we partner with someone else? What's not already covered? Everyone's doing roughly the same diseases in different ways. How does someone like the Australian government, a new entrant to the field, how can they fit? And as Andrea said, there are so many different conditions to work around now. And finally, and this is something that's not really been tabled before, most of these lack a pipeline approach. They use calls for proposals. And everyone goes, oh, that's fantastic. We've got investigators will tell us what they want. But investigators want to research their own area. That's the truth. They don't go out and say, I've reviewed all the global needs in the world. These are the gaps. It's not my area, but I think this is what you should do. So I actually think funds need to be strategic. I think having a fund with hundreds of millions of dollars, which will be driven by uh, calls or investigator interest, might not be the best way to go. I think there does need to be some priority setting, ideally from WHO, to say these are the most important gaps. These are the ones that kill the most people. These are the ones to do first. And now comes a slide which these are the things I'd really love to hear the audience um, input on. So these are, I think these are implications that we, we need to air and give more of a talk about. There's a number of products like vector control product, products that fall outside the scope of any of these funds. So I think we really need to think about things like vector control, microbicides, family planning. Most funds like to do drugs, vaccines and diagnostics. What about the products that aren't covered by a fund? The other thing is, and Andrea touched on this, there's competition between funds. This is crucial. European member states are going to say, do I fund P2Ps or do I fund the, EDC, the pooled EDCTP fund? Either way, it's not good to have people put it, pull out of PDPs, but it's also not good to have people pull out of the EDCTP. So I think that's an issue. Uh, PDPs are going to have to compete with the market funds and they're going to have to compete with the WHO open source fund. And I think the WHO fund is the one that's most likely to change people's behaviours because... Small funders and aid agencies don't have the capacity to make choices. They want to go to someone that will tell them what to do. WHO is seen as safe, it's seen as developing country friendly, it's seen as the health authority. Now what people, people probably don't think about it, but then they go in with a fund that says, um, we require open source, it's likely to favour public projects over projects with industry partners, and that's partly its goal. Um, so you'll start to get, I think, a change in the type of R&D that we're doing depending where people put funds. So there is a risk, I think, that small government funders and new government funders will say, I'll go with the WHO with its IP conditionality rather than with PDPs who work with companies in IP um, because it's easier. The other issue is that low-funded funds tend to do certain kinds of work. They favour diagnostic work and low-hanging fruit because they're cheaper. So if you have funds with not very much money, like the pool, the pool fund projects that, that are in WHO now are all very low cost quit win projects because the money's limited. So you're not getting the R&D you need, uh, the R&D you need, you're getting the R&D that matches the size of your fund. And again, I think that's an issue. Um, if you go with EDCTP, it has been heavily um, weighted towards academic sort of operational implementation research rather than product development. I know that's something that they're aiming to change. But if most of the funding goes to EDCTP, we're going to get a lot of operational implementation, capacity building, probably less product development. So I think we need to think about, um, about those issues. And finally, I, th I think it... I think it does need discussing the role of WHO because the WHO has chosen a different path to everyone else. So they've chosen the path of saying we don't want to have private intellectual property. I mean, that's the focus of it is that it's kind of an open source R&D fund and all the other funds are traditional public health non-profit funds that say we'll work with partners and IP, that's fine. So WHO has really kind of put a stake in the sand in a way by saying one of our requirements is delinkage and open source. That's important for us in the projects we fund, while the rest of the world is kind of going down the, the previous TDR path, where you worked in, in, in a pretty well the traditional way. And I, I know Rob will probably want to talk about that, but it, it is the case that it has very different requirements to any of the other funds. Mm -hmm. And again, I think that's worth... Um, it's much more political than any of the other funds, which are much more pragmatic, let's just do R&D kind of funds. 
So that's what the things I would love to hear about. Uh -huh. Actually, great for me because you touched on a few of my questions and I'm going to actually just really let you respond to particularly Mary's I last point, it, Rob. It is worth perhaps just a little bit of clarif clarification around the IP question because that's come up. Um, I think at the moment, certainly with the proposals for the, uh, for the WHA fund, it's not so much no IP, but it's certainly about putting affordability and accessibility right up front. So that means about having an IP management regime which allows for that. So it's not excluding IP or trying to, you know, so I think we, n we just need to sort of um, finesse that, that point. But it is very much around affordability and accessibility. I think the interesting point, that's emerged from this discussion actually is about how do you actually feed the pipeline and I think that that is quite interesting and it, it does look as if pooled funding is perhaps not a mechanism which which does that but then we have a lot of national and philanthropic uh, funders of research that, that maybe that's their role but br bringing in where do you bring in the pipeline and the product development I think that's that's quite an interesting question and I'll be see whether anyone wants to to react to that so um, it, it is fair to say, uh, you know, pool funds are not the answer. They're not a, a panacea, they're not the answer, but it, it looks as if they're certainly interesting uh, in terms of changing uh, behavior and changing mentality. What, what I've heard is because of the, the different types of fund, we have a whole mixed uh, approach out there. And it's, it is interesting to hear from the product development's perspective that they're having to, to really do quite a lot of maneuvering to, to position themselves in order to meet those different expectations. And it does sound as if, if maybe the, the, the range of pool funding that we got out there is actually making things slightly harder rather than easier. So that's, that's, uh, that's a good point. I, and I just have a few questions for the panel, and then we're getting quite a few questions from, from the broader community, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, but I, I would love to hear some reaction about this idea of, of portfolio funding, though, not just, you know, that's part of the pipeline question, but is there room, is there, or have there been pooled funding mechanisms that have, have taken more of a portfolio approach versus a project-specific approach? I know that this has been a challenge for a number for a lot of product developers is that funders are tending to focus more on projects rather than a portfolio which allows the science to guide more of the decisions rather than what the funder has deemed to be promising. So I don't know if, if any of the panelists can speak to that. I, th I mean I think uh, if, we, if we sort of think about pooled funding as a mechanism regardless of the topic area then there are some very good examples uh, say within physics and uh, CERN, you know, within biology, with the European uh, Molecular Biology Lab, and these types of pooled membership arrangements where you're getting funds from a whole different types of sources and they're funding quite upstream research as well as product development. So I think uh, in terms of precedent, it's out there. I think within health, perhaps not so much. And so, yeah, it, it, it's interesting. There's nothing that would exclude pooled funding from doing that. I think the fundamental question which, which has been raised a couple of times is this, this need for attribution and this, this need for, for uh, almost sort of ego-driven funding where uh, organizations need to have that credit, you know, they need to have the credit uh, for their re research and of course pooled funding pools that attribution and I, you know, so it seems as if that's a, almost a, a cultural barrier that we're going to have to get over. Um, if we're going to, you know, maximize the, the efficiency of this approach. Sure. I'm just sure. adding to that. Yeah. I think um, Rob's example is, I think we're better at pooled funding for one big thing, like CERN or the human genome. I think we have got less experience at, at, at the funding going out. So we're quite good at putting funding into joint projects. Yeah. But we're not very good at um, portfolio management because that's not how government, because portfolio management in global health means across all countries across industry, academic, research institutes, developing world and developed one, picking the best projects. Well, that's not something we've been good at. Mm -hmm. And that's what pool funds were meant to do. But I think they've made themselves so conditional that they're hampering their ability to do that. I mean, in this place, what I would say that this is really important, this, this remains a very, very important role for the product development partnerships. That is, all of us maintain mm. portfolios. Now, whether or not there's some a uh, greater force up above that says it's more important to, to fund leishmaniasis or tuberculosis or whatever than it is. But as long as the product development partnerships remain healthy, there's actually multiple healthy 
uh, um, uh, pipelines. Um, and that, I mean, I think that's a question that, that the global health community has to ask itself over time. I would say certainly that for a malaria drug pipeline, there's a healthy one, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the question about whether or not that gets, what that gets funded up against is, mm -hmm. I think, maybe the place where you're, where you're coming. Yeah. 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 And, and Laura, a question for you. I mean, all of these changes that um, EDCTP2 has made, I'm very curious from an advocacy perspective, what had to change politically to make, you know, to make those commitments? Some of them are pretty significant and substantial and do require a lot more of the, the European Commission and of member states. So, mm -hmm. so what do you think was a driver for that other than it being sort of a moral need that, that mm -hmm. um, uh, Rob talked about before? Well, I think there was a very much um, a recognition that EDCTP, although it had quite a small budget in the first program, that it had managed to leverage funding, that it had demonstrated that its ability to, to successfully work as a, as a pooled funding mechanism. But I think on a political level, yeah, there, as I mentioned earlier, there wasn't really a true partnership between Africa and Europe. And I think um, the sense of um, that it was work, unfinished work, that there was still a lot more that the, that the mechanism could achieve. And, um, and so by, by supporting a second program, by making these, uh, these changes so that African members could really be partners, um, I think that really sends a political message as well um, to allow, I mean, it came up yesterday, I think, in the discussions as well about the importance of trying to, um, to get, for example, the BRIC company countries also more involved to take ownership on, um, yeah, on the, the, the research and, and to commit to, to supporting that. And, you know, for example, now that we have uh, South Africa on our, on our mem as part of a member of, of um, EDCTP, you know, we can also now encourage them and other African countries to, to make more contributions. We can, we can track also their spending through some of the mechanisms we're using. We're part of our work plan is to, to track what we're calling participating state-initiated activities. And these are, this is a sort of a, a means for us to, to track in-kind contributions to the program. And so South Africa is one of our participating states. We will be working with them to try and identify activities um, not only in-kind contributions, but to also generate more cash contributions to the program. So I think there's a political will in that sense, and, and we've really seen also at our launch event last week that there's, there's strong political will from the African countries to really be mm. partners in this partnership now. And, and let's not forget, of course, the EU of at course. a higher level yeah. is a, a pooled fund, a massive pooled fund. Yeah, I mean, and they've so. been significant drivers <coughs> of the program as well. I mean, yeah. of course, it's had to go through huge hurdles through the parliament, yeah. through the council, and there has been the political will throughout to, to see it through. So, mm. so I'm, I'm now going to turn it over to our, to our online um, participants. Okay. Uh, and this sort of keep, it continues with, with political, what ha needs to happen politically. What, so what needs to happen to get countries like the U.S., so I think they mean really the U.S., <laughs> on board with a pooled fund, it, fund for health R&D. You know, Mary, you talked about the fact that the U.S. hasn't been engaged in any of them. You know, is there, do you see there being any type that could be developed? You know, the U.S. is the world's largest pool fund. That's the real story. So if you look at um, government funding, the U.S. puts in about 70% of government funding in the world. So what the, and 10 times more than the next funder, which is the AC. So they're putting about 1.2 billion a year and NIH is the main source of that and across NIH they they know what they're doing and it's kind of coordinated ish <laughs> so I suppose they say we're a gigantic elephant you're all little mice why would we coordinate with you maybe you should coordinate with us I'm not sure it would be easy to get the US involved I don't know if others feel differently but they have the capacity to make their own decisions, and why should they? What's their motive? What would there be incentive? I, I can think? say from a Global Health Technologies Coalition perspective, there is a move to try and actually increase, at the very least, coordination across the U.S. agencies trying to do funding, so they're at least mm -hmm. talking yeah, to each US, other to yeah. maybe, I don't know, that I would not call it a pooled but fund. Claire, that is a, that what you said is exactly the thing. People want it. You can increase coordination without pooling. Because how you coordinate is you agree, it's like, a, it's like shopping for a wedding list. Someone says, these are all the things I need, and you can go and 
pick the one that suits you best. It's not a bad idea. Rather than saying, everyone has to put all their money in and buy one big present all together because you'll just fight. So in a way, you could look at coordination. You can get coordination without pooling. You can get coordination by agreeing common goals and letting people pick them and providing information on what everyone's doing. So you can go, oh, well, I'll do that bit then. So I, have to, I would really love to see more information and less actual physical mm. pooling. Can I say that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just add on that comment, just because I think also, um, because you, you, you have this um, illustration of, you know, the different, quite fragmented, you, you're illustrating in a way that the, the mm. pooled funding mechanisms are quite fragmented. But I think also another way of looking at it is also that the pooled funding mechanisms can also coordinate. And, and we're already starting to do that now. And yeah. the EDCTP2, for example, with WHO TDR, we have a joint call that we've now launched. Yeah. And so we're trying to coordinate, although we focus on different things, we're also trying to coordinate uh, the way that we fund things. So we have our, our call on, on um, clinical research and development fellowships. And, and, and you know, TDR focuses on... on what they focus on and we focus on, on our, you know, Africa and, and the, the diseases that we focus on. So I think there's a way for doing that more in the future as well. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily have to be seen as fragmentation. Mm -hmm. and, in, and in a sense, I mean, mm -hmm. I made the point earlier, but it's worth re-emphasizing the, the intention for the WHO fund is that integral to the project-based funding is some funding for some of the, the bits that sit between that, which is the ob an observatory. So some way of developing a global agreement about what are the priorities so that we don't all buy toasters uh, so that we can actually try to to work out you know how do we how do we sort of divide what seems to be a sort of uh, set envelope of funding and, and so to a certain extent how you know how do we how do we think inside that box how do we work more with what we have uh, always trying to think about how we can expand it but i mean really being much much better at coordinating and so that that core funding that, uh, that is so important for every organization it, you know, because project-based funding is really quite difficult to deal with if you then have to, you know, you have to do your planning and your, all of the other bits that, that sit in between uh, all of that. So as I would say, one of the things which I, I hope uh, from um, you know, the, the WHO fund is, is that we will actually be able to, to start to develop a, a global picture so an example, you know, I was talking to uh, at, at a group uh, under the, the World Intellectual Property Organization a few uh, weeks ago, and uh, one of the things that they were saying is that we don't seem to have a, a sort of compendium or a go-to place that actually will give us a target product profile for every need that's out there. There isn't something that really gives us, you know, everybody something that we're all looking at. They exist either in the, the, the portfolios of the PDPs or in different research papers that have been published or maybe within the Gates' his own strategy, but nothing that you can actually take in one place and look at it and, and start to see this global picture. And I think if we can, you know, with the, the different funding mechanisms on the one side, in the same way that IP was always talked about as being the big problem, funds are always talked about as being the problem, one of the, the, the simplest things actually but seems to be the hardest to get to is just what is what are the problems and how do we how do we agree on what those are, and if we can get a little bit better with that type of information, then uh, then perhaps we can uh, move forward. Because to me, coordination is an outcome. It's it's really really hard to to sort of enforce coordination. I think coordination tends to happen when there's an agreement on where we're going, and then people tend to move towards it. Um, you know, everybody loves coordination, but nobody wants to be coordinated. Rob, we've had a few questions, which I think you've, you've answered in that, but one um, about uh, the, the f pilot fund TDR is what does it mean to leverage low- and middle-income countries from a practical standpoint? Well, at the moment, we're getting uh, s pledges from, from member states, from our member states, um, and what they're saying is they will give a certain amount to the fund. Um, uh, but then there's an additional amount that they will give. But what they're saying is they will match the funding that they receive from a low or middle income country classified by the World Bank classifications. So to a certain extent, what they're saying is, and that's leverage, it's basically for every $2 or $1 you get from uh, a low income country, this donor country will match it with, with funding of their own. And we've got a couple of donor countries that are making that type of pledge right now. And I think that's really interesting. I'm not I don't know whether that's actually going to start to unlock 
uh, unlock the doors, but I was talking to DNDI yesterday and they were saying, yeah, they're getting some interest from uh, not a national funder, but a, a, um, a, a non-government funder uh, within a, um, a, a sort of low middle in income country, but they only have a small donation to give. But they're thinking if they can give it into a pooled arrangement, then to a certain extent, they don't want to have to deal with project management and reporting and all of those things. They just want to be able to, in a sense, buy a kind of quality assured process that they can buy into and perhaps have some of the, sh the, the shared success. So again, I think if, if we are trying to think of mechanisms of expanding the traditional donor pool and bring in disease endemic countries, in, in the way, I think this might be one, only one, of the mechanisms that may, may start to do that. So we have also been asked b for by a few people uh, whether or not, what countries, can you say which countries have pledged uh, and how much? Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> uh, I, at this stage, it's probably best not to, uh, not because it's just, uh, as with many things in WHO, it's always a little bit unclear at when public becomes public. I, yeah. I suspect by... Uh, we have an executive board meeting in January of uh, 2015, and uh, it's far, far better for the countries to speak, speak for themselves uh, on this issue. Can so. you give us an idea of the, the size of the funding budget? Uh, well, at the moment, we have, we're around about 10 million, so it's still very small in terms of global, uh, global health needs. Uh, but I think uh, if I can be... Uh, just speak amongst ourselves. Um, <laughs> uh, it's quite often, and the whole internet. yeah, and the whole internet. Uh, it's quite often with a certainly with a WHO resolution. The resolution is to a certain extent the easy bit, and the funds often come sometimes many years after. This is, uh, I think, one of the few occasions where the funds and the resolution are actually uh, overlapping somewhat. So that's that's encouraging, um, and uh, you know I can only sort of you know we always have to speak in the glasses. I wouldn't say half full, but it's starting to fill. So that's something to be to be positive about. And you know, for many other resolutions, you know, it took many many years for for the resources to flow. But what I, what I can say is that there is no lack of will and interest uh, amongst the the people that are sort of you know working in this area. There really is a passion to try to see. Uh, what can be done within the political constraints that everybody's operating under, within the multiple uh, array of uh, priorities that people are having to, to operate with. Um, but I think we're doing a, a pretty good job of, of moving things forward. The, the phrase, you know, de-linkage, um, MSF came up with it perhaps sort of 10 years ago, and it was highly controversial to even talk about it. Now it's, yeah, you know, everybody sort of, it's sort of almost common parlance. Everybody more or less understands what we're talking about, you know, separating the R&D costs from the, the costs and the accessibility of the product. And that's become a sort of accepted uh, and sometimes misused concept. But so um, always, I think when we're operating at these kind of global levels, we have to sort of think in... Um, in longer timescales, you know, yeah. things are shifting. But if we look back, you know, even if we look back sort of 10, 15 years ago, that, you know, the PDPs were just a glimmer uh, in a few people's eyes. And now, you know, we have uh, many PDPs. Some might say more than we need, but we have many, many of them. And, uh, you know, they are beginning to show a real, real difference. So, yeah. I'd, I'd like to actually um, uh, point out something important for the PDPs in this, which is that one of the reasons that um, we have more than 20 products that have come from the PDPs is that we have been small and nimble and able to move quickly. One of the real downsides of coordination is what, um, what ends up being the slowness of the, the need to coordinate many different people, agendas, countries, time zones, all of those things. Most of us, I think, spend most of our days, in fact, coordinating <laughs> such things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so while coordination is something indeed that we generally want to agree on, what we could lose in this process of coordinating is exactly what we have gained by being small and nimble and being able to move quickly. And this is really, mm -hmm. this would be a real loss. It would be a real loss even with a very large pool of funds. So uh, I don't have an answer for it, only a caution 
that's something that could take yeah. 10 years and another 10 years and another. Meanwhile, we're losing time and we have people who are yeah. dying. Actually, can I point another strength of PDPs that I'd, I'd really like to point out? Actually, and of the, the, re the public research system is it's been delinked for decades. So it's never funded. None of this research is funded from, from getting profits out of patients. It's funded by public funding and philanthropy, and the products are made available at very low prices. Um, so I think that's the other strength of the system, that it did delinkage. It, that's how it was built and that's, uh, for decades. So it has never funded its work through uh, charging patients high prices. It funds it through this $3.2 billion of public and philanthropic money, and that's why we can get affordable products. So I think that's another real strength of PDPs, that they've sort of piloted this before it became common parlance, as Rob said, mm -hmm. which I think is wonderful. Um, and, and that they've been so responsive. And that's uh, putting big portfolios together relatively quickly. I mean, the number of PDPs have put out, if you look at all the new drugs and vaccines developed, PDs, PDPs have developed 70% of them mm -hmm. since 2000. So they've put out over 20 products. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. And very, very small and efficient organizations, right? So we're actually yeah. talking about um, so the, these, these small organizations that are able to have a very specific expertise that can fail products quickly, that can manage things very quickly. Is, is a, it's in fact, in some ways, the fragmentation or the very, sp the very specific nature of the PDPs, which has allowed for this kind of uh, quick movement. Yeah. Mm. So it Sorry, if I may, you going to want to move us Sorry, on? I'm going to move yeah. okay. I want to make sure our participant yeah. questions if, as, as we can, because I think this conversation we could certainly talk about for a while. <laughs> um, but one thing that came up too was, um, has there been pooled funding dedicated to technology transfer? And I'm going to add capacity strengthening. Um, that's such a critical part of, I mean, we, we have EDCTP. Has there been anything that also has had a more narrow scope? So how... You know, we think PDP certainly that is an important part of the work that they also do, and maybe not always in the mandate, but it's what they do in order to achieve their mandate. So just be curious to hear about technology transfer and, and capacity strength and pooled funding mechanisms used for that. Yeah, so I think obviously EDCTP is, is one of, yeah, it's a flagship program for capacity strengthening and also transfer technology to, to sub-Saharan Africa. And um, so um, certainly from our perspective, I think we, we meet that, um, that question in that sense. And, um, you know, just in the first program alone, we've, we've um, funded over 500 trainings and um, there's been a lot of um, capacity developments at trial sites. Um, we've done um, some calls. In fact, one of our joint calls we did with the Gates Foundation was also to prepare capacity for clinical trials for HIV vaccines. Um, and you know, we have a flagship fellowship program, senior fellowships and uh, career development fellowships. And with the new program, we're also continuing that. And we, alongside that, support a lot of um, uh, c capacity strengthening the establishment of, of regulatory systems, ethics committees. Um, we're certainly trying to ensure that the regulatory processes are also much more efficient in sub-Saharan Africa. So I think from our perspective, our our funding mechanism has been very much focused on, on ensuring that there's sustainable capacity development and, and, and certainly, for example, some of the, the specialized networks of excellence that we've set up in, in Central, Eastern and Southern and Western Africa, um, they, they are entirely based on ensuring that the capacity is, is improved in Africa and, um, and they're also starting to now be also more self-sustaining. They're getting funding from other funders. So I think our program has certainly been focused on, on that. And um, I don't know whether there are some other programs you would. Well, I, I mean, it, I think it's fair to say that certainly most development programs, and so, I mean, yeah. TDR is a good example of you know, a research program which has been focused on capacity building since its inception. Um, I don't think there's, if I understand the co question correctly, I don't think there's anything unique per se about pooled funding and, and building capacity. I think building capacity should be something that's always thought about, particularly uh, if we're working in low resource countries, because otherwise we will never get out of this particular sort of cycle of everything being sort of donor led and, and, and sort of donor, donor driven. And so um, building capacity, and this is certainly the, the whole 
I, I would say at the heart of EDCTP is about trying to transfer not just the technology but also the, the, the sort of capacity of the knowledge um, because if we can get to that stage if we can build that capacity uh, and, and certainly there is that capacity there then we can start to shift the um, the, the mindset and the, we can start to build that kind of political will and desire to drive uh, an, an indigenous research uh, um, activity within within a country and there's been you know there's many many studies the OECD and others which show that if you have a vibrant research um, community within your country then it, it really does contribute to your economy and this is one of the drivers in you know why America has such a uh, you know, a large investment in its R&D processes because it knows that it drives, uh, you know, drives the economy. So, at a kind of much larger development sort of based um, argument, then yeah, building capacity is, is, to be honest, is is at the heart of, of this. And you know, the EU has been very uh, supportive. If we, you know, we we tend to be focusing very much now the the the, the, the consultative expert working group and the um, the work that's been done at WHO about sort of uh, the, the difficulties of, of feeding the pipeline for re research uh, um, and products for, for neglected diseases, but it, there's, there's eight other elements to that whole strategy, and one of them is, is how do you build capacity for local production? Uh, so one of the things that, um, you know, that I've also uh, worked on, and again, it's another part of, of this very <laughs> large pooled fund, which is the EU. This comes out of the development branch, not the research branch. Um, uh, but again, it's about building capacity for how we could actually start to move some of the production uh, of uh, drugs and vaccines and diagnostics um, into um, low and middle income countries as well. So uh, again, uh, it's taking these, you know, a broader and broader approach to, to trying to solve um, some, of, some of these access issues. So I just wanted to clarify that, you know, EDCTP isn't just about, of course, right. building capacity. I mean, we do yeah. it. It's, it's part of what we, we obviously, our focus is on supporting clinical trials. And, and alongside that, we want to ensure that there's an enabling environment for that. So um, I think it's very important that, you know, you're supporting product development, but you can have the products, but you need to also have then the capacity to, to implement them, to, to roll them out in the systems in, in the developing countries. So that's really what we're trying to achieve. It's not just capacity strengthening. Yeah. And, and we've had we had a question as well, just about the, the that upstream, making sure that we're not forgetting about that more upstream part and and downstream part, right? That that it's we want to fill the pipeline, but also how are we making sure that these products are getting out into the market and also getting it operationalized um, efficiently? So we're making the most of. We can have a great product, but mm -hmm. if we don't know how to actually implement it and in the health system it's not going to be as effective. So I just wanted to make sure that I made mention of that. There's also been a, a question about, um, ad, but there's a, actually been two, about um, administrative costs of pooled mechanisms and that we need to think about, you know, that what's going in there is also not necessarily all going towards mm -hmm. the actual R&D. Um, and does that ever get raised by some potential um, donors who might have small amounts of money who then sort of feel like all oh, my money is going to go to to paperwork? Hmm. Has that been raised by? Everyone's looking at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say, yeah, it's an obvious question, um, and I think you know it is. It is. The, I think the, the what we're trying to think of with any kind of pooled arrangement is, particularly if you're a small donor to a pooled arrangement, what you really want is to be able to buy that quality assurance that there is a governance mechanism, that there is a transparent process for making priorities, that when the money is spent, there is some audit trail and it can be followed. Those are really important issues and those are really expensive to do, but they shouldn't take up the vast, you know, they shouldn't be larger than the, the, the fund itself. So, I mean, certainly, uh, you know, we're trying to operate on percentages which are single or only two-digit percentages, you know, trying to get it down uh, as low as, as possible. But I think, and, and the, you know, there are ex recent examples from large global funders where, you know, without the, the appropriate sort of quality assurance and monitoring and evaluation processes, then things can, can, be, can go wrong. So, we, you know, we, I think that, you know, it has to be recognized that there is always a cost in administering 
uh, the money correctly because there's very, very little advantage in putting money uh, into something that's, that's not working in the right way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a question that's uh, always raised and I think it's something that needs to be raised and something we have to work very, very hard at, uh, at sort of keeping to the, to the minimum but not at the, at the cost of actually reducing the quality of what we're trying to do. We've, we've also had um, some, qu some questions about what, we, Andrea, what you raised and Mary, you touched on too, was this idea of the impact of pooled mechanisms on existing funding, mm -hmm. um, on some of that bilateral aid. And it's, it's just some people asking if you can speak a bit more about that. What, how is, has, you know, thinking about historically with pooled funding mechanisms, how has that been reconciled? Um, and in thinking, moving forward, you know, from a product developer standpoint, how do you actually talk with your donors, with your funders about, about that, recognizing the importance of mechanisms like EDCTP to your broader mission? No, you Can I go stop. first? Yeah, you go first. Okay. Um, yes, we, um, in, have we had uh, explicit conversations? I think we just had one today, in okay. fact. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. So are we having these conversations? Indeed we are. Um, the bilateral funding for those of us who are deep uh, in the product development process right now is critical. It is absolutely critical. And to lose it would be devastating. Point final. At the same time, I would also say that these pooled funding mechanisms such as GHIT um, have really brought in new donors, new actors who... But GHIT is targeted to PDPs. Yeah, indeed. And, and it has actually brought in donors that would be would have been impossible for the PDPs yeah. themselves to have mm. to have brought it forward. It's really taken leadership um, in the Japanese government from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and others to to, to bring this in. Um, so, um, is it necessarily going to um, to reduce uh, the our ability to work with bilateral donors? Absolutely not. Um, could it? It could, and that would be far worse than the than the ability to ha to have a yes, larger money. pool. At least for the sp for the speed of those of us who are already um, deep in product development. Yeah, I, I have to say that's um, uh, back in the day when PDPs were quite early, and and we'd done a piece of analysis on PDPs and what was the most efficient uh, place to invest. Was it PDPs? Was it TDR? Was it um, uh, industry and so on? Um, we had a number of funders, especially small funders, asking us, should I invest in, was it, should I invest in TDR or should I go with these PDPs? And uh, certainly for a number of small funders did say, TDR is just a safer bet for us and we'd rather do it that way. And as I said, I think that is probably, um, I, I think this will only be, f more, more be for new funders because it's really, really hard to pick amongst, uh, bi bilateral funding is hard for small people. Um, so I think that's definitely an issue, and I think that's why WHO needs to be, um, and is being, you know, quite thoughtful about uh, what they fund, because a number of these funds don't fund PDPs. So if people choose to go with them, they, pr they predominantly fund other things. So the GIT's nice, because they predom G -hit or GIT, yeah. predominantly fund PDPs, mm -hmm. but some of the, the WHO fund might struggle to fund um, at PDPs because apart from very specific projects because of their conditionality. EDCTP did have problems before, though that will apparently change. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it very much depends if you're a PDP or not. Um, and, how the, and how the fund is structured. And, and how the fund is structured. Unit aid is another one, right, where, where it's, where as a, as a product development partnership working with, with Unit aid has been, has been very successful for us. It's really mm. quite something. Um, because there are a number of countries that give in to unit aid who do not, who do not give um, directly, plus their particular remit has caused us to think about some of the downstream uh, activities mm -hmm. that, that in, in, terms of, in terms of supply chain and, and, and those kinds of things. Um, one of the things I'd, I'd like to say in this is I, I don't want to sound like an advocate for fragmentation, but I do, mm -hmm. wanna s I do want to say that many voices continue to serve us well. Um, partly because we, we can easily, as a global health community, get engaged in a kind of groupthink at any particular moment, which, mm -hmm. might, which groupthink might have to change in a couple of mm -hmm. years because mm -hmm. uh, we realize that insecticides are, you know, are, 
failing so rapidly and it's harder to change the, mm -hmm. the thinking. And so these many voices and many actors in many, in, in many ways is useful for us. Claire, can I raise one thing that I think is a, a real problem? And I'd love to hear what you guys sure. think. Just, I want to recognize we have five minutes left. So oh. Okay, I'll be yeah. one minute. <laughs> That's fine. I, I think I we need to distinguish. Maybe can I think we need it. to distinguish between the value of pooling funding to get more money and the value of coordination. And the real value of pool funds was meant to be coordination. I don't think we have that. So it was meant to um, be priority setting. And maybe what it is is we need to do that outside the funds and let the fund work towards those identified priorities and the value of the funds will actually be raising new money in a way that's easy for funders. I think we're mixing together the two things and it's clear that the pools aren't very good on pipelines and coordination because there's too many of them and they're too conditional but they are potentially quite good in raising money from new funders. So I'd love to have a follow on webinar <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's a really important distinction. We tend to think of them as one big thing. Well, I th yeah, we do, well, we have. I mean, I, would, I would, would suggest that what we're trying to do in this WHO approach is that we are trying to get to that kind of global picture. But it's not, I, I would, wouldn't want anyone to think that uh, we're trying to argue for a single approach to anything. Because everybody can agree that's not going to help anybody, and particularly in research, because um, it's, it is about sometimes, you know, you having to spread the risk, follow many, many, many different leads. And so, you know, uh, I wouldn't even say it's fragmentation. It's diversity, and that's healthy, that's and, and, and you know, so let's go with that. Um, so, you know, but I do think we've... It's been interesting listening today. We have heard some of the ways about how pool funds can be structured, organised, and recognising what you are hoping to achieve by the conditions that you put on your fund and who that may or may not allow, you know, entry into. So it's, yeah, it's been really helpful. It's been really helpful for me, anyway. <laughs> I don't know about anyone else. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, think that's, I think that's a good point. And I think also, I, I don't think we should necessarily see it as fragmentation. I think, mm. indeed, as you say, it's diversity. And, you know, these pool mechanisms, they're set up for reasons. And in our case, it's to, to ensure that there is a focus on sub-Saharan Africa and, and ensuring that partnership. But it doesn't, I think we can all be complementary in the way that we work mm. and, and, um, and that we can try to coordinate better. But I think also, as you say, there's a very big role for... Uh, leveraging funding and in our case certainly in our second program we really want to leverage funds from from endemic countries African countries and also from industry and and third parties so I think they yeah there are two sides to the argument and I, I, I your point is taken but I think um, um, they still I think they still have a, a good role yeah, in it, role. yeah. yeah, yeah. No question. I think we all agree on that don't we, mm -hmm. we like like pool funds. there is no <laughs> right there's no one size fits all there's no one fund there's no one type of organization um, that can answer all of this or else we'd all be doing something very differently than we're currently doing uh -huh. so um, being mindful of time I really I want to thank um, our panelists for such a dynamic um, conversation and for our participants online who sent in lots of questions and apologies to those of you who we were not able to touch on your issues. Um, and I want to thank uh, uh, Norma Wakefield who actually helped tremendously with the logistics of this and, and Jennifer Woolley who helped with the concept for this series and making it a, a reality. And again, thank you to our our panelists for, for joining us. And please do, there is going to be a survey that pops up on your screen. I encourage you to take, it will take no more than five minutes, I promise, um, to uh, just give us some feedback. This is a pilot, so the more information we can get, the better the next one can be, and thinking about what topics you would find interesting in any future webinars that we do. So thank you again, really oh, appreciate you, your man. time. Thank you.